All right, my name is Dr. Nishnor Valkan, and uh, I'll be your entertainer for next one hour. <laughs> and hopefully it will be a, a good experience for you. As you know, we all have learned a lot about MOOCs. How many of you know MOOCs? All of you? And everyone is curious about where it is going, what's going to happen to it. And I think in some of the uh, presentations you may have seen earlier, uh, MOOC uh, phenomena is relatively new, as we all know, 2010 or so. And there are a lot of people who are doing MOOCs, but I'm going to focus on three uh, MOOCs which I have been inspired by, and then I'll get into the adaptive MOOC that I have been uh, working on, and it has been deployed uh, last month, and it is going on right now. So what you are seeing is right off the press. And I think you are all very, very fortunate because you are seeing the first presentation on the first adaptive MOOC in the world, <laughs> as far as I know. So if you look at uh, uh, the idea about adaptive and the MOOCs, these are two different ideas, and we are trying to combine the two. So I'll talk about adaptive learning. Because there's also a buzzword of adaptive learning now used everywhere. Everyone claims to be adaptive. It turns out that they're adaptive learning, and they are what is called pseudo-adaptive learning. So I'm going to make sure that you understand the difference between real adaptive learning system and what are so-called pseudo-adaptive system. And we will then understand uh, how we combine the two ideas. So to begin with, uh, just a little bit of a history, and this will be more or less personal history, how I got into the MOOC and my background uh, starting from MIT research, and then getting into the pedagogical framework, some of the case studies on MITx, EDx, and also understanding what is uh, C MOOC, what are the X MOOCs, and now we will introduce a new term called A MOOC. So we will add another coinage to the genre of MOOCs, which is called adaptive MOOC, or what we call now A MOOC. So with that, uh, we want to talk about sustainability issues of the MOOC, because uh, we all wonder if MOOCs are all free, how we can sustain it. So there are different models, and I had a organized a conference at UMass uh, where we got all the top players. We asked them this question, what is the sustainability of the MOOC? The answer was, we don't know. So you are as informed as I am about sustainability of the MOOC. So then we we'll, uh, get into the details of the first adaptive MOOC where I'll show you quickly how it all works. And what I've done, I've taken screenshots and I'm giving you the URL. Please register to this online MOOC and you can experience yourself. The reason I'm doing screenshots on PowerPoint because we can go quickly without worrying about whether the network is working or not. Mm. Then feel free to go in and play as much as you can. So, and then I have a few conclusions to talk about. So massive open online courses, the way I see it, it, uh, it the name came from the genre of gaming. A lot of you know about MMOG. Massive multiplayer online game. Mm -hmm. If you are playing FIFA, you are connecting with the, the player all over the world and you're playing together, creating your own teams and all of that. So the massive idea came from that understanding that if we can create courses very highly interactive and you can provide an accessibility to a large number of students together, and if they are able to not play together, but they can learn together. So this is where the MMOG concept also transfers here, because students are learning with each other in forming teams. And I'm told that some of the MOOCs which have been provided and taken in places like Singapore and India, people are calling each other saying that, I'm taking the same MOOC, can we meet on the cafe and work together on the problem set? So this is kind of transformational in some sense, and I do have uh, uh, certain ideas how MOOC can become really transformational if it is done right. And that's the big underline, if it is done right. So what is that done right? We'll talk about that. So if you look at here, my journey in the MOOC started with one of the uh, one courses. Of the remarkable things I just mentioned to you. Let me stop there. Because uh, I was a uh, uh, faculty in mechanical engineering at MIT. And then I worked with uh, some of the courses which we are trying to put online. I did a course in the area of uh, molecular dynamics, which is the MOOC also is about. And I brought in silicon graphics machines in the classroom. And everyone loved it because they could see the action in the classroom. 
and see all the atoms connected with the supercomputer. So I was given uh, discretionary funds from the Dean of Engineering saying that, can you do this for other faculty? That's how I got into it. And one of the first projects that we did there was physics interactive video tutor project. Primarily because our undergraduate physics at MIT had 18 to 20 percent failure rate, Ds. Mm -hmm. And what happens that the great students which are highly selected come to MIT and then they fail for the first time. They get into heartbreak hotel or motel or something. <laughs> <laughs> because they have never failed in their entire life. This is the first time they get there and they fail. So we had a lot of issues, the depression, and in some cases, extreme cases of suicide as well. So we redid that entire course called Physics Interactive Video Tutor Project. And I was the architect of that project along with Professor Walter Lewin, who was the teacher, which I will show you how he taught in the classroom. I hope you can hear it. Is that the period of the oscillations is independent of the mass of the object. That would mean if I join the ball and I swing down with the ball, that you should get that same period. Or should you not? I'm asking you a question before we do this awful experiment. You come. Oh, my expectations are high. I want to hear you out. You ready for this? Sorry. Yeah. Three, two, one. Ah. And here. inspired by his teaching quite a bit because he would do so many experiments. This is what we call as the, some of the best teachers, master teachers in the world who really inspire students. So the question is that how can we take that genre or that kind of teaching put it online? So that's where I started looking into some of the ideas where I was chief architect of MIT Singapore project where we created five master's degree program for the three universities in Singapore with 30 faculty, MIT professors working with me. Think about my trouble with 30 major faculty from MIT and making them do the work. <laughs> so with that uh, deployment, we were able to get a lot of understanding about online education. And I created an online uh, platform called HYPE, Hypermedia Instruction and Teaching Environment. And this is what uh, we then used in some of the MIT open course here. So this MOOC phenomena has not sprung up from nowhere. There is a lot of history behind it. And I think often people think that this whole thing happened in the last couple of years. No, there's a lot of history. So the first one of the open courseware came out in 2000, 2001, where MIT put all their coursework online. And then we did some of these pedagogical experiments like physics interactive video tutor. I created uh, wet labs and web labs, virtual learning, uh, augmented learning, then we went into virtual reality-based learning. We did lots of experimentation and came up with the idea that the courses have to be not one size fits all, but they have to be adaptive. And similarly, OKI also came out at the same time where I was part of that project where we created Open Knowledge Initiative, which later on became Sakai. So many of you know Sakai that came out of the OKI uh, framework, and that was the framework. And if you look at the recent history at MIT, in 2012, the first course was taught by Anand Agarwal, and this is the timeline. You don't have to read that, but they're making a lot of progress with EDX. So in fact, in a way, it was a revival of open courseware in terms of EDX project. And when I talk to Anand Agarwal, my colleague from MIT, he says that, you know, this is OCW 2.0 is essentially EDX. So with that, a uh, lot of understanding, if you look at brief history, 
open courseware, open knowledge initiative, then open source, Moodle, Sakai, which came out, Yale lectures, Berkeley lectures, Khan Academy, Stanford first move in 2011, and some of the MOOCs around the same time. And then we now get into the MOOCs. There are about 500 MOOCs, and there are about 3 million people taking MOOCs and things like that. In fact, I also heard some of the statistics from Coursera that they have 333 courses and growing more and more, and they are uh, going to very large number of studentship registrations. But I also talk, uh, understood from them is their number of reg uh, certification is very small. So they claim that there were 3 million students uh, going through them, then there were about 300 certifications. Mm. Something to think about. So genesis of MOOC, I think the way it became, although there were other people who were doing MOOCs of some kind, but the way it became very highly publicized because of the Sebastian Trone's work where he created one of the first uh, MOOC open uh, and provided that to entire uh, world at, uh, without knowing, without uh, understanding of Stanford. So Stanford were surprised by 165,000 students coming to it and suddenly this, uh, this took the imagination of all kinds of publications. So if you look at Chronicles of Higher Education, everyone started talking about it. This was a simple course in the area of computer, computer science, uh, how to build a search engine. And that sort of uh, has become now a history of MOOC, so to say. And his colleagues, Andrew Nuck and Daphne Kohler, then went out and formulated a company called Coursera and got funding from uh, Kleiner Perkins, which is a very high-end uh, uh, venture capitalist from Silicon Valley. So did uh, Sebastian Tron. He started a company called Udacity. But if you look at it in terms of uh, not-for-profit world, there are a lot of universities like University uh, Stanford, MIT, Berkeley, they're all getting into uh, some of these consortiums or their own thing. So what I wanted to focus for today's discussion is what is their learning interface? So let's cut the, we say BS, right? And let's go right into how they teach what they do. So what we are going to do is look at, this is the Udacity course, because this is the first off the ground. And then we look at, there are lots of courses which are out there. And then what we are going to do is look at uh, uh, how they are teaching these courses. So this is their typical interface. So if you look at a lot of video lecturing, uh, Khan Academy style, and there's voiceovers. And then if you look at on the right hand side, you can look at all the quiz, etc. what they do. On the top, you can see there are a uh, classroom, which is essentially the video lectures. Then you have discussion boards. Then you have announcements and the progress and all that. But if you look at it in terms of variability of the content, it's not there. So it's one size fits all. However, and that could be one of the reasons there, there's very large attrition rate. Right? So that's one of the interfaces which we talk about in Udacity. Now, and if you look at Coursera, now as I said, they have a large number of courses. And now let's look at their interface. So this looks uh, like uh, the interface that you would see in any online education. And I think that's where a lot of people who have been uh, from USDLA and Sloan C and, and Educause are saying, well, we have done this for hundreds of years. Why are you telling us this is something new? And the, the new thing here is that they are available from the top-notch faculty, from the top-notch school. So you get access to this exclusive club which you did not have access uh, earlier. That's one factor. But once the curiosity is over, then the question comes, are you going to finish the course? Are you going to learn from it? And there are a lot of things that we are learning about it doing this experiment, which I will share with you. In this interface, you can see that there is a home, there is syllabus, course information. It all looks same. And then, of course, there are video lectures, a whole bunch of video lectures here. Again, you have to listen to the video uh, 10 minutes to 30 minutes. Then you have to go on, uh, on the discussion board work with fellow students, figure out problem sets, and then uh, upload the problem set. And most of the content and the assessment is what we call is auto graded Because there is no way a faculty or even a bunch of students, uh, TAs, can grade 165,000 students. So that's the that's reason is that the, the assessment is limited, and it is provided in an auto-graded way. So there are a lot of work is now going on how we can really work with the auto-graded environment. And that's where some of the uh, tools, uh, which are uh, online learning tools or online learning labs, 
are being used. For example, in the course that uh, was taught at MIT in the circuit design, there was a tool where you could do the circuit design yourself. It's an online software tool. The molecular dynamics course that we are doing at UMass, there is a tool called Virtual Molecular Dynamics Lab. So you have to have certain components that you can connect together and work out so that you have certain way of doing hands-on. And that's an important component. If you just put video on and there's no tool, then there's not, not much to do there. So this is uh, the interface for, uh, for Coursera. Now let's look at EDX. And I've studied EDX, uh, uh, collaborate with them. And in that, if you look at, they have very high-end courses like quantum mechanics or quantum chemistry taught by the well-known professors at MIT. They get a lot of students flocked in, but you know, all numbers are not 150,000. Some courses get 20,000, some courses get 5,000. So do not be enamored just by 150,000 number. It's not true for all the courses. However, it's much larger than the classroom size. So you look at that. So in this case, again, these are the video lectures recorded. There's a lot of uh, dependency on video lectures. And then you go into interactive exercises, and this is where more and more innovation is going to happen, how you capture interactivity and how you capture that in terms of doing the assessments, whether a student is learning or not, or they're getting to certain competency or not. So that's one. And then if you look at uh, discussion board, I really do, don't get this. So you put it on the, the website, and I really don't get it. What is this equation? And then five people say, hey, I understood it. Let me help you out. But not all the time, so it's all over the place. So, but there is a social construction which is happening here, which is an important part of the MOOC genre as we go forward. And then, of course, you can create interactive periodic tables, you can create interactive elements, just like I talked about it. And if you look at all these auto-graded assignments, are essentially done by the system. So now it, it depends on how many different ways you can do uh, online assignment, and that restricts again the way you can use MOOCs and you, you can do assessment. So here is the statistics. So I saw MIT's presentation on it where the, the pyramid was reversed. Because what they were claiming was uh, from the same statistics, it depends on who is looking at it. So the way I looked at it is that we start 155,000 enrollment, then if you look at only 23,000 try, which is dropped to 14.2% from 155,000. Then you go to 9,000 who took the picture, the first one. So now you're dropped to 5.8% already. And then if you go to 7,000, which is completed, some in some shape or form with not much competency, but they touched every point of it, that goes to 4.6%. Then finally, 348. So if you look at, and I think uh, once you do statistics, if you take away 155,000, which is an erroneous number, which probably you should not consider because a lot of people are curiosity bloggers who just want to come and see how is this being taught. If you look at 23,000, if you look at then 340, still it's very small number. So there's very large attrition rate that we are looking here. And that's one of the reasons where, where I started looking into how can we not only make uh, these books sustainable, and it won't be sustainable if the production cost is going to, uh, through the roof. Most of these courses, what I've discussed with uh, people at MIT X as well as uh, EDX, is coming out to be 300 to 500,000. It's a very high production value courses, high production value. And then the question is that if 340 students got, it, got uh, really something out of it, then is, the, is that kind of investment justified? So we need to answer that. And I think the answer remains in the number one uh, question is that how can you increase the completion rate? How can people get more out of this MOOC experience? And that's where we said the low completion rate is one of the big problems. Courseware is one size fits all, which has been the consistent problem even for online education the way we have done it. If you look at dependency on the video lectures, quite boring, you really don't want to watch them. Then if you're going to need more instructional design, and if you look at their instructional design is very flat, very flat. In fact, most of the online courses have much better instructional design than the MOOCs. So if you look at here, the quality of content, again, it depends on the professor who is teaching because it's the video content from him or her. It's not connected with the books most often. And so there's no editorial control. 
It depends on the quality of the professor. So that's a question mark. Not a personalized experience, which is where I'm going with saying that you have to have personalized experience if you want to do a MOOC. If the MOOCs do not have personalized experience, you will be lost in no time. And the result will be you will not finish. And then if you look at automated assignment may not, may not be sufficient, so you have to add some of the virtual labs and virtual interactivity, virtual activities that you can measure and you can see. And then, of course, sustainability is in search of revenue model. So if you give, uh, if you have $60 million funding, $30 million from MIT endowment, $30 million from Harvard, of course you can do lots of MOOCs. But if you do not have that and you are a small <coughs> university in Denmark, then how would you do $30 million investment? So I think those are the questions that we address. And I, so I think the question there is, there, the MOOCs as a free is a great idea, but the question is that how can we create alternative models around that free MOOC that we can generate revenue? It could be a tutorial model, it could be test preparation model, it could be providing additional services model, and there are a lot of different ways people are now thinking, just like Coursera, about authentication, the signature. Uh, for authentication, they are charging you $45. And so, and of course, if you have 50,000, 200,000 students, that goes a long way. So this is where they made money for the first time, and their revenue was 212000 this year, mm -hmm. with the funding possibly of $30 million. Great. I like that number. But I think it's going to grow as we go forward. So if you go to the value of certification, all of these MOOCs are not providing credit. Only five of them are accepted by ACE. And ACE credits are all only accepted by 1,800 universities, not all of them. So the question here is that what is the way for accreditation of these courses? High production value, very high quality of instruction from the top professors. How can I get a credit? But there are some bypass ways that have been created. So Udacity's model is that if you got A grade in, in the online course in, let's say, search engine design, I can get you employed in Google in no time. So they are, what they are doing is that they are doing talent management. So now you are bypassing the, uh, the university completely. Yeah. If you take 10 MOOCs and you have done A in all of them, possibilities are you don't have to have a degree, you can get a job. Why do we need universities? Question mark. So if you look at uh, another issue which has been brought out is plagiarism. You do not know who is at the other end. So that's where the, uh, the Proctor U and all of these other companies are trying to do proctored exam so that you can do authentication as well as who is taking the exam. And that has become a very big issue. And authentication of student is where people are trying to make money. And the second one where the revenue is being generated is transfer of credit. So the way it is happening is that if you take a physics course on a MOOC, and then you have to take an exam offered by, let's say, University of Massachusetts, if you pass that exam, University of Massachusetts will give you X amount of credit, but you have to pay for it. Once you pay for it, let's say you paid $400 for it, 85% goes to Coursera, 15% goes to university. And I thought that was very skewed, but I think the models are going to change. But another sustainability model, there is transfer of the credit. So watch out for the models which will come up. So as you are seeing, the, the, all these MOOCs are free, but they may not remain free if you want to get the credit, which is absolutely true. You will not get a credit for no money, because that's how <laughs> universities make money. So in, in terms of now getting back to what can we do with the MOOC, so based on my research in the area of brain and cognitive psychology and brain-based uh, learning system, what my approach has been to go away from one size fits all to adaptive individualization or adaptive learning. And what I mean by that, and I must define that there has to be four elements in any adaptive